So the first thing to remember is that rotator cuff is diseased tendon, right? So you're not taking a normal healthy tendon with the exception of perhaps an acute traumatic tear. You've got collagen derangement, you've got disorder der derangement, you've got type uh, 3 increasing, type 1 decreasing, vascularity and tenocyte abnormality. So you're fighting against biology. Uh, and, and whether we talk about how great our cuff repairs are and how great our patients do, I mean, re-tears happen. And perhaps it's not this, the, the relative degree of uh, hyperbole when, when Ken Yamaguchi and Lisa Gallus published their 94% uh, re-tear rate. But honestly, it's probably closer to about 20% when you take all comers. Um, and that's not that, uh, that, that, that should be better. We should be able to get better at it. And 20% retail rate should be alarming. We don't have a 20% complication rate in any surgeries that we're going to recommend to patients. So we talked a little bit about this on the last panel, but there's a couple of points I want to bring up, and I think they set the table for why or, or how I consider revision rotator cuff surgery. First, Bruce Miller looked at this, and what the, the, the important findings that he found were that the majority of tears, re-tears, were within the first three months, 78%. And in this study, he had a 41% retail rate, so relatively high. Joe Iannotti looked at this similarly um, and found that his mean retail rate was about 20 weeks or 19.2 weeks. Once again, these two studies combined together are letting us know that when you're going to get in trouble, it's going to be in the very beginning. The next thing to think about is, uh, is from George Morrell, and if you guys don't know him, you should really read his studies. He wrote an amazing one on tennis elbow, was able to do a sham surgery in Australia, and he continues to publish amazing, uh, amazing research. But what he showed us is what we already know, it's almost as the gospel, that the failure, the mechanism of failure is really the tendon suture interface, a lot less than the anchors. Dr. Burkhardt has figured out how to make good anchors, they last, they work, but now it's the biological tissue that we have to address. And the weak link here is the tendon suture interface. So when do re-tears happen? Well, you know, really, they're not re-tears, they're early failures, and perhaps it's a failure to heal, not necessarily a re-tear, absent the acute traumatic fall in the perioperative period. And rotator cuff healing, we know, is slow. It's six months slow. So our repairs are not always good enough to hold on long enough so that the tendon can attach back down to the bone. So uh, with that preface, I guess my talk would sort of be, how do I manage the unhappy patient after rotator cuff repair? And I'm going to focus on, on arthroscopic solutions, not the, uh, the tendon transfers and the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, which Dr. Hartzler is going to talk about, and which are, I, I think, good things. The first question I want to ask myself is, why are they here? You know, what is it about this patient that brings them back into my office? Because we know, and we can debate a lot, we know that many patients, in fact, the majority of patients who have uh, MRI or ultrasonographic re-tears or failure to heal are not back in your office. We also know that healing gives you better outcomes, but re-tears don't. So what is, what's making them unhappy? Are, is it pain that's making them unhappy? Is it weakness? Because healing's not necessarily required. So I don't want to, you know, as Einstein told us, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results is insanity. I don't necessarily want to go in there and do the exact same thing all over again. Did they ever get better? Are they infected? Are they stiff? Stiff is a common reason for pain, and you can release or address stiffness um, and, and, and get them better. Is there mispathology? Did they, did they forget about the biceps, the AC joint, the subscapularis, right? Selective injection to try and see where this pain generator is part of the issue. So I'm just going to go through a couple of modifications, a couple of ideas on how I'll do this. The first one is a KISS modification. It's keep it really simple, Zappy. Um, and if they did well for a while and they come back, and if your force couple with your subscap and your infra are intact, rehab it. And the data shows us that 54% of patients can have durable two-year or greater success rate when they come in a couple years later and have a re-tear. So it does not go right to operating room. Uh, and that's something to remember. So if keep it really simple, it uh, doesn't work. Then I go to option two, and this guy comes in, and he's, he's, uh, he's unhappy. He's got some arthritis. He's got, you know, anchor granulomas. Um, so I, I start preparing myself. I'm like, okay, well, what am I going to do? He's a pretty functional guy. He's, you know, 69 years old. I can't do reverse mania. I'll get yelled at it on the podium. So I get my brain going. I'm like, okay, repeat the last one I did. And I'm going to stack my anchors. Peter told us about stacking anchors. And then I'm going to bone graft my holes with, with, bone, with bone, bone sink. And then I'm going to get allo sink because, you know, really the interface between the bone and the tendon is going to be very important in these revision cases. And somehow reconstituting something closer to a Sharpie's fiber as opposed to a fibrovascular scar is going to be important. So I got, I got really excited. I got ready to go into this case. Um, and... Uh, and I decided to keep it really simple. I tenotomized his biceps tendon. And the guy, uh, 
do we have audio? Can I get uh, And then anyway, don't worry about it. The guy says to me, you know, I'm ecstatic. My pain is all better. So looking at missed pathology, getting a good examination, and figuring out what the pain generator is. So now look, keeping it simple, rehab, keeping it super simple, looking at simple missed pathology. Now you got to get back to, to repair it. So you're gonna, I'm going to get back in the operating room. I'm going to either what I call a dumb down or perhaps a dumbed up repair, something a little more simple. So these, you know, these repairs, I am exactly simpatico with everyone in the Burkhart group. This is it. This is what I want to do. I want a luggage tag, anterior and posterior to reconstitute my cable. But this is not what I'm going to get in revision rotator cuff surgery. If you're getting in there and the tendon has this much mobility, there's been some gross error on the first surgery. And that's you know, not often the case. So it, the indications, I got green lights, uh, yellow lights, and red lights. You know, pain, I want to treat. Age, age is going to be very important. Jay Keener let us know that the single most important factor in healing of rotator cuffs was age. And his age inflection point, very frightening, was 56 years old. Once you got above 56 is where we see the majority of these patients, you have a significant decline in healing. Hopefully it's smaller than the first time that I got in there. I, I want to have the opportunity before there's too much atrophy. I start to get nervous with superior migration. I mean, there's some I'll tolerate, but as it gets higher and higher, I get very nervous. I'll tolerate a little bit of arthritis too, but you know, it's not run to. If their deltoid is insufficient or if their axillary nerve is insufficient or if they had some sort of overly aggressive acromioplasty times two or three, and I'm really, I'm not going to go after this cuff. I think it's, a, it's an issue. And again, I want to look at my untreated pathology. I want to hope that I can find a biceps AC or, super, uh, or subscapularis. I want to hope that their suprascapular nerve may be a candidate for release. And I'm going to look for stiffness. And the stiffness here, post-operative stiffness, is not just capsule release. There's a lot of subdeltoid stiffness that you have to address too. So you have to be above and below to get an effective result there. So what do I need to get done in this repair? I need to, I need to make it a stronger repair. I need to speed up the healing somehow and I have to address this trifecta of, of what I think will determine healing. Anatomy, biomechanics, and biology. So step one, get to the OR and trust your gut. Because you know, you're gonna look at this tissue, you've done 15 years practice, 10 years of practice, you know what you're looking at. So in, in this study, I looked at, I correlated, I said, I'm gonna look at this, I'm gonna create a rotator cuff score. I'm gonna look at the tendon, I'm gonna tell you if it's thick, thin, elastic, inelastic. I'm gonna take a biopsy of that tendon uh, at that time, and I'm gonna grade that tendon score, and then I'm gonna take ultrasounds afterwards. So I'm gonna put these all together, and I will predict who, and who can't heal, because I know what a tendon looks like, and I know what diseased tendon's gonna look like. Multivariate analysis, I went through, I got age, gender, repair status. We talked about Goutelier, I talked about thickness, fraying, stiffness of the tendon. And then you don't get to say this out loud, but the, the way you score tendons is the boner score. It's really true. So that's the tenocytes, the ground substance, the collagen, the vascularity, and you add it up and it's a, it's a total of 12. So look, what we did is we put these all together and here's what I found out. You don't know what you're looking at. The degree of tendinopathy, we had three different surgeons looking at how diseased this tendon was or wasn't. And what I said it looked like had nothing to do with what it looked like histologically. So your, your interpretation of delamination, of elasticity, doesn't mean the tendon is sick at all. So seeing is believing, not, not really. The same study panned out looking at, uh, at, at open tibia fractures and the degree of muscle, uh, muscle necrosis. Surgeons graded muscle necrosis, said, oh gosh, this is bad, we gotta carve it out. Wrong. So don't trust your eyes. So don't trust your gut is what I'm saying when you're looking at tendon. Muscle disease on your MRI may not be able to overcome. Tendinopathy is overcome. You can. So don't trust your guts. Here's some other options. Our panel talked about this. Maximize your, your biology. We talked about minim, uh, medialization of the, uh, of the articular surface to get a little more real estate. Go up to five millimeters, right? Use, use the ring, ring turret, create vents, whichever you want, create a crimson duvet. You want to try and get some, patho some healing from the bone up. Um, the next thing you want to do for an option for a failed rotator cuff is, look, a partial, a partial cuff repair, pulling your infra up and getting the biceps out of the way can be very effective. Derek Cuff here in Florida looked at this, and he had 75% of his patients satisfied in a durable way. There, there is some argument that, that says that Sean and his group looked at this, and they said, look, you know what, maybe it's not so durable. They deteriorated after two years. So debridement alone may not be the answer, but partial repair may be a reasonable answer, even in a revision setting. Next option I'm going to consider is, uh, is a medialized repair. So once again, 
I'm going to medialize the articular uh, cartilage by five millimeters. I'm going to place my anchors relatively medial, and I'll use a suture configuration where, where I take one mattress and then two simple bites. So I'm going to use a triple loaded anchor, recognizing that three stitches is 50% stronger than two stitches. So whenever I can, I'm going to use a triple loaded anchor, and I'm going to, I'm going to lay this down. We use the word a low tension repair, but what we were really thinking about, at least in the lab, is a low strain repair. And your strain is your change in length over your original length. And when you, when you see, when you look at tenocytes in cell culture, when you apply strain to tenocytes, they don't react well. So when you have a low strain repair, uh, you're going to do better. And that's going to get, to, it's going to touch on the idea of augmentation and how I want to reduce the strain on this. Option three. I'm, I'm totally on your team on this one, Dr. Burkhart. I want to go Burkhart on it, right? The idea here is, is, to, is to use your ripstop technique. And I really think about this as a cable reconstructive technique. Uh, and, and when I first did it, I, I was so amazed at, at what happened. And really, you know, the way I, I've done it is I pass the fiber tape all the way across anterior to posterior. Um, and then I'm going to pass my, my, my ripstop sutures around it. I like to use the lasso because it just helps me see and place it exactly where I want to be. But what's, what's interesting to me after this, uh, here you see, there's your ripstop, there's your sutures coming out on the medial side. You see I did not do necromioplasty yet. Right over here is my posterior cable reconstruction. I'm coming all the way across, and over here is my anterior cable reconstruction. And that's going to be, I'm going to put them into two separate uh, into two separate anchors, but that's really going to link down. And I'm going to maybe if I, maybe I'll have a residual weakness or residual tear in the center aspect of that. But a lot of people will function very, very well if you can restore their anterior and posterior cable. So I think that's an important tool, and that's going to be an important tool even in getting into other stuff. Um, and I just won't play that. What are the results? So let's be a little data driven in everything I talk about. What are the results of revision rotator cuff repair? Well, imaginably, they're not as good as primary. Your retail rate, as opposed to we talked about the 20s, your retail rate is going to be around 40%. Your complication rate, your stiffness, infection, all is going to jump up to about a 20% rate. And that's extremely high. So this is not surgery to sort of say, oh gosh, don't worry about it. You better think carefully about the why. Alex and Patrick and, and Dr. Burkhart uh, looked at this in, in meta-analysis and really at the end of the day, they also found about a 40% retail rate, but 70% satisfied. So that's a pretty good number without having to take out your metal and plastic and augment. I think that this is something we started to talk about and I'm not talking about interposition. So Steve Snyder talked about interposition and, and that's really been sort of good and bad. And other than Steve and Allison Toth, I don't know that a lot of people uh, have published well in it. But what, do you can do, what can you do now? Well, you can use dermal augments. I use the A-Flex 3. You can use amniotic patches. And the amniotic, uh, as we alluded to earlier, may not be doing the same thing in terms of structural, but it's probably an MMP inhibitor. And we know that MMPs are going to be concentrated in your bursa and in your rotator cuff afterwards. So here, um, just a couple points on my augment. It's not just an onlay. I don't just take this thing and lay a bridge on top of it and expect it to work. It's very important to me to reduce the strain. So I want to unload my rotator cuff. So my medial sutures are going to be through, uh, through the graft. My repair is done. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to tie this thing immediately. Then, independently, I want to load that graft. And I want that graft to sit on top of it and protect me from, uh, and protect my repair and get me through that six month window. So I, I, that's, that's going to be my trick. And what are the results? Again, data driven with revision cuff repair with augmentation. Primary, it's very exciting. You can see a lot of really neat results. And I would submit to you that in a lot of patients, you want to look at that. But your retail rates are, are going to be between 40 and 60%. Once again, with about 70% of your uh, patients being satisfied. What's next? What about additional biological things? Well, we can, we can, with special sauce, we can call in an angel, or we now you can start to think about the graft net and the thrombinator as a combination if you want to be a little, uh, little more uh, cost consideration. And you can see, I, I don't have a hot, whole lot on laid into her, but I've got a graft laid down. I left the corner stitch uh, before I put it in, and you'll see what I'll do now is I'll take the bone marrow aspirate, I'll take a spinal needle, I'll slide it underneath my sandwich, I'll let the water leak out, and I'll fill it up with, with bone marrow. Is this completely crazy? No, we just talked about Hernigo looking at this, and we talked about Peter Mill's uh, evaluation with, uh, with, with PRP. So there is some role for this, uh, and for me, again, in revision setting. 
What are some of the other bad actors? Rob, uh, Rob Harster did actually write an article about this, and he said, look, grade three, infraspinatus. The infraspinatus is a bad actor. Infraspinatus atrophy, infraspinatus necrosis, osteopenia, smoking, opiate dependence, uh, active range of motion. These are bad, bad actors for the setting of revision rotator cuff repair. So um, look, at the end of the day, there are fewer and fewer revisions for rotator cuff repair. Um, We've got SCR, we've got SCR sandwich. Uh, I do think tendon transfers, and, and for me, it's gonna be a, a lower trapezius. It's a very effective operation, and we do have reverses that are gonna be indications for it. So thank you. Um, don't miss the pathology, reduce the strain, reconstruct your cable, think about the, uh, think about the dermal augment.